We've got a bit of a cute little teardown for you today. This is actually a uh, crystal oscillator from the 80s, built in May 1985 by NDK, as you would have seen. They still make oscillators today. This has got a, a bit of a story behind it. I actually pulled this out of a uh, decommissioned NDB, which is an aircraft navigation aid, back when I used to work for those guys, and I've still got it. I've never actually powered it up or taken it apart, so I reckon it might be interesting to see what's inside. Now, these are designed to be really accurate units. You can see the frequency is indicated to six decimal places. We've got 48.281482 megahertz. This is an ovenized crystal oscillator, so there will be a little oven in here and a temperature sensor and a feedback loop that keeps the uh, crystal at a certain temperature. There's also a little uh, frequency adjustment pot on the back here that you can see. Um, that's just a little trim pot. And we've got three coax terminals. We've got uh, the output, which I assume is the output of the oscillator. We've got, I assume that's power input, and then the oven, which I also assume is power input. So these are probably power inputs, and then that would be the output. Just taking a bit of a guess that the outside is ground and the inside is the minus 15 volt rail on that middle terminal. And I've got that connected to my lab power supply. And then I'm looking at the oscillator output on my scope and we'll see if anything interesting happens. And I'll turn it on. It's drawing about 20 milliamps and we've got a signal, so looks like that was a lucky choice. Quite a powerful little thing actually. It's spitting out uh, about two volts RMS and the frequency that's listed here is 48 megahertz, but I wouldn't trust this reading on the scope. It's not very accurate. We'll have a look at that on the frequency counter. I've got the output connected down to my frequency counter down here. And it says that we're looking at about 48 megahertz, which is in the ballpark. But this is still, compared to the 4828.1482 that it says on the crystal packaging, that's pretty far out. I mean, either the crystal is completely out of spec or it's because I've got the oven turned off. So let's try and turn the oven on and see if that improves. Now the inputs look like a bit of a mess, but that should do it. I still don't know if my oven pinout is correct, but it seems to draw about half an amp in this configuration, which seems about right to me, so I reckon it's okay. All right, with the oven on, does it improve? It's drawing about half an amp. It doesn't seem to be changing much. If anything, it seems to be going down. And after about 10 minutes, it looks like the frequencies just kept going down, so... Hmm... The other thing I noticed is that the output current has actually gone down and settled, so... It's probably getting up to temperature now. Well, seeing as I don't really care about how accurate it is because we're just about to take it apart, uh... I can try turning the little fine-tuning pot and see if that makes a difference. And that doesn't really seem to affect it very much. Alrighty, let's have a look inside. We've got a bunch of screws, two on both sides here, and four on the top. Let's get rid of those. What have we got? A bunch of insulation. Nice. Under that, we've got uh, this element here, which I assume is a temperature sensor. It looks like it's been kind of brazed or soldered onto the oven assembly, which is probably what this is. If we have a look around behind here, we've got this interesting little board here. Looks like it's taken a bit of heat damage on the left-hand side. You can see that's a lot darker than that. The code on the board here is COSMO 091760, and I could not for the life of me find anything to do with that on the internet. Next challenge is going to be figuring out how to get this apart. So, there are a bunch more screws on the bottom, and these are probably the next most accessible screws, so I'll just take those out. Well, that looks promising. It's actually, uh, this whole section in the middle has come loose. You can see, I can actually wobble that middle section a little bit now. I'm a bit concerned about these coax connections on the side because they seem to be kind of pressed in there, so hopefully these outputs are on cables of some description. But I'll try and take this little unit out. Oh yeah, that seems to be coming out. Chunks of insulation that have been well stuffed in there. I hope there's nothing dangerous in this insulation. Alright, the damage so far. Now the leads from this main unit to the coax connectors here are quite small. You'll see that this one's drooping a little bit, that's because I actually tried to unscrew it, but I figured it's easier just to cut these off. 
And here we have our little module. What I might do now is try and remove these screws here and separate that PCB. Pretty long screws there. This board's actually proving pretty difficult to remove. Um, it looks like, if you can see in there, there is some big element, looks like a big power transistor or something, has been glued to the oven enclosure, so... I'm applying a lot of force to it and all I can hear is the PCB starting to crack, so I don't know if that's going to do any good. I may actually have to desolder this big element here. I'm only working at 300 degrees here. So, that's the heating element. That is some sort of power transistor or something, and they're probably just using this oven as the heatsink for the transistor, because why not? We might take more of a look at that later. Hey, we got it! And as I suspected, that's just an NPN power transistor. Let's get rid of the rest of these wires, shall we? I'll just remove the temperature sensor, one of the heating coil connections, another one of the heating coil connections, and a single wire that goes into the crystal circuitry. Not sure what that's for. Next thing I'm going to do is take off these screws on the bottom here. Okay, what have we got inside? And another bunch of screws. Seems to be coming out. And there we go, there's our crystal. And we've got a bunch of control circuitry on the other side. It's not a humongous crystal, but there's actually a surprising amount of stuff going on in here. There's your crystal board. Interestingly, the code on the crystal is 48026, which is kind of strange because that's actually the first few digits that we saw on the frequency counter when we were looking at the output of the oscillator. Anyway, what I might do is take this thing out and then run that through a tracking generator and see if we can see what the frequency response of this looks like and see if that matches the value that we've got in the cover. HiQ is the brand. I'm gonna have to solder these guys on. And I'd say that is ready to go. I've got the tracking generator going into the crystal. The output of the crystal is going into the spectrum analyzer so that we can see uh, resonance peaks. And then I've got the auxiliary output of the tracking generator going into the frequency counter so that if we go into zero span, then we can see the exact frequency that we're looking at. Okay, so on the left here, you've got DC and then we're looking at 10 megahertz per division. So if you Hop over five divisions, you can see a resonance peak here at about 48 megahertz, and that's the mode that we're looking at. So if we just zoom in a bit on that, then you can see that we've got a peak and then a trough, and that's what we expect because at series resonance we're going to see a peak because the impedance of the crystal is a minimum, and then when the impedance of the crystal is at a maximum we're going to see what we have at parallel resonance. So if I just switch the analyzer into zero span, then we should be able to get a more accurate reading of what the frequency of series resonance is, which is probably what the uh, crystal oscillator circuitry is keeping it at. Now what I want to do here is get the zero span line at that maximum. So it looks like this is where series resonance is. And this is a lot closer to what the crystal itself said on it than the whole oscillator assembly said on it. So. Not sure exactly what's going on with that. Just for the sake of completeness, I've gone ahead and taken the whole thing apart. So this is what's left of the case of the crystal after I ripped it apart with some side cutters. We ended up with a bit of an interesting babushka situation because inside the big case I actually found a small form factor crystal. One of those more standard sized crystals that you see around. So that's kind of interesting that they've actually taken a big crystal package and then stuck a small one in there. I don't know whether that's a common thing to happen because I haven't actually taken a lot of these apart. But yeah, I thought that was kind of strange. Anyway, I took the uh, small form factor one apart, opened that up, and then now we can finally see the quartz crystal here. So I'll just give you a nice close-up shot of that. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this video. If you've got any idea why uh, the crystal itself is designed for a different frequency to what's written on the oscillator packaging, let me know, because I have no idea. Uh, hopefully this was interesting. Hopefully it wasn't too anticlimactic, because I was hoping that the crystal might be a bit bigger. I mean, it's really the frequency that dictates the size of the crystal, so it may have made sense 
for some models of crystal to actually use a smaller crystal inside the big one and for the lower frequency crystals actually use a large physical quartz cut. Maybe the reason they do this is so that they can sell all the different frequencies in the same package. That's all from me. I'll uh, see you next time.